Part 5, The National Economy. Chapter 16, National Output. Common sense observation, as well as statistics, are necessary for assessing the success of an economy. Theodore Dalrymple. Just as there are basic economic principles which apply in particular markets for particular goods and services, so there are principles which apply to the economy as a whole. For example, just as there is a demand for particular goods and services, so there is an aggregate demand for the total output of the whole nation. Moreover, aggregate demand can fluctuate, just as demand for individual products can fluctuate. In the four years following the great stock market crash of 1929, the money supply in the United States declined by a staggering one-third. This meant that it was now impossible to continue to sell as many goods and hire as many people at the old price levels, including the old wage levels. If prices and wage rates had also declined immediately by one-third, then of course the reduced money supply could still have bought as much as before, and the same real output and employment could have continued. There would have been the same amount of real things produced, just with smaller numbers on their price tags, so that paychecks with smaller numbers on them could have bought just as much as before. In reality, however, a complex national economy can never adjust that fast or that perfectly, so there was a massive decline in total sales, with corresponding declines in production and employment. The nation's real output in 1933 was one-fourth lower than it was in 1929. Stock prices plummeted to a fraction of what they had been, and American corporations as a whole operated at a loss for two years in a row. Unemployment, which had been 3% in 1929, rose to 25% in 1933. It was the greatest economic catastrophe in the history of the United States. Moreover, the Great Depression was not confined to the United States, but was worldwide. In Germany, unemployment hit 34% in 1931, setting the stage for the Nazis' electoral triumph in 1932 that brought Hitler to power in 1933. Around the world, the fears, policies, and institutions created during the Great Depression of the 1930s were still evident in the 21st century. The Fallacy of Composition While some of the same principles which apply when discussing markets for particular goods, industries, or occupations may also apply when discussing the national economy, it cannot be assumed in advance that this is always the case. When thinking about the national economy, a special challenge will be to avoid what philosophers call the fallacy of composition, the mistaken assumption that what applies to a part applies automatically to the whole. For example, the 1990s were dominated by news stories about massive reductions in employment in particular American firms and industries, with tens of thousands of workers being laid off by some large company, by some large companies and hundreds of thousands in some industries. Yet the rate of unemployment in the U.S. economy as a whole was the lowest in years during the 1990s, while the number of jobs nationwide rose to record high levels. What was true of the various sectors of the economy that made news in the media was the opposite of what was true of the economy as a whole. Another example of the fallacy of composition would be adding up all individual investments to get the total investments of the country. When individuals buy government bonds, for example, that is an investment for those individuals. But for the country as a whole, there are no more real investments, no more factories, office buildings, hydroelect hydroelectric dams, etc., than if those bonds had never been purchased. What the individuals have purchased is a right to sums of money to be collected from future taxpayers. These individuals' additional assets are the taxpayers' additional liabilities, which cancel out for the country as a whole. The fallacy of composition is not peculiar to economics. In a sports stadium, any given individual can see the game better by standing up, but if everybody stands up, everybody will not see better. 
In a burning building, any given individual can get out faster by running than by walking. But if everybody runs, the stampede is likely to create bottlenecks at doors, preventing escapes by people struggling against one another to get out, causing some of those people to lose their lives needlessly in the fire. That is why there are fire drills, so that people will get in the habit of leaving during an emergency in an orderly way, so that more lives can be saved. What is at the heart of the fallacy of composition is that it ignores interactions among individuals, which can prevent what is true for one of them from being true for them all. Among the common economic examples of the fallacy of composition are attempts to save jobs in some industry threatened with higher unemployment for one reason or another. Any given firm or industry can always be rescued by a sufficiently large government intervention, whether in the form of subsidies, purchases of the firm's or industry's products by government agencies, or by other such means. The interaction that is ignored by those advocating such policies is that everything the government spends is taken from somebody else. The 10,000 jobs saved in the widget industry may be at the expense of 15,000 jobs lost elsewhere in the economy by the government's taxing away the resources needed to keep those other people employed. The fallacy is not in believing that jobs can be saved in given industries or given sectors of the economy. The fallacy is in believing that, there are, that these are net savings of jobs for the economy as a whole. Output and demand. One of the most basic things to understand about the national economy is how much its total output adds up to. We also need to understand the important role of money in the national economy, which was so painfully demonstrated in the Great Depression of the 1930s. The government is almost always another major factor in the national economy, even though it may or may not be in particular industries. As in many other areas, the facts are relatively straightforward and not difficult to understand. What gets complicated are the misconceptions that have to be unraveled. One of the oldest confusions about national economies is reflected in fears that the growing abundance of output threatens to reach the point where it exceeds what the economy is capable of absorbing. If this were true, then masses of unsold goods would lead to permanent cutbacks in production, leading in turn to massive and enduring unemployment. Such an idea has appeared from time to time over more than two centuries, though usually not among economists. However, a Harvard economist of the mid-20th century named Seymour Harris seemed to express such views when he said, Our private economy is faced with the tough problem of selling what it can produce. A popular best-selling author of the 1950s and 60s named Vance Packard expressed similar worries about a threatened overabundance of the staples and amenities and frills of life, which have become a major national problem for the United States. President Franklin D. Roosevelt blamed the Great Depression of the 1930s on people of whom it could be said that the products of their hands had exceeded the purchasing power of their pocketbooks. A widely used history textbook likewise explained the origins of the Great Depression of the 1930s this way. What caused the Great Depression? One basic explanation was overproduction by both farm and factory. Ironically, the, the depression of the 1930s was one of abundance, not want, not want. It was the great glut or the plague of plenty. Yet today's output is several times what it was during the Great Depression and many times what it was in the 18th and 19th centuries when others expressed similar views. Why has this not created the problem that so many have feared for so long, the problem of insufficient income to buy the ever-growing output that has been produced? First of all, while income is usually measured in money, real income is measured by what that money can buy, how much real goods and services. The national output likewise consists of real goods and services. The total real income of everyone in the national economy and the total national output are one and the same thing. They do not simply happen to be equal at a given time or place. They are necessarily equal, always, because they are the same thing looked at from different angles. 
That is, from the standpoint of income and from the standpoint of output. The fear of a permanent barrier to economic growth based on output exceeding real income is as inherently groundless today as it was in past centuries when output was a small fraction of what it is today. What has lent an appearance of plausibility to the idea that total output can exceed total real income is the fact that both output and income fluctuate over time, sometimes disastrously, as in the Great Depression of the 1930s. At any given time, for any number of reasons, either consumers or businesses, or both, may hesitate to spend their income, since everyone's income demands, sorry, depends on someone else's spending. Such hesitations can reduce aggregate money income, and with it, aggregate money demand. When various government policies generate unnecessary, sorry, uh, when various government policies generate uncertainty and apprehension, this can lead individuals and businesses to want to hold on to their money until they see how things are going to turn out. When millions of people do this at the same time, that in itself can make things turn out badly because aggregate demand falls below aggregate income and aggregate output. An economy cannot continue producing at full capacity if people are no longer spending and investing at full capacity. So cutbacks in production and employment may follow until things sort themselves out. How such situations come about, how long it will take for things to sort themselves out, and what policies are best for coping with these problems are all things on which different schools of economists may disagree. However, what economists in general agree on is that this situation is very different from the situation feared by those who foresaw a national economy simply glutted by its own growing abundance because people lack the income to buy it all. What people may lack is the desire to spend or invest all their income. Simply saving part of their income will not necessarily reduce aggregate demand because the money that is put into banks or other financial institutions is in turn lent or invested elsewhere. That money is then spent by different people for different things, but it is spent nonetheless, whether to buy homes, build factories, or otherwise. For aggregate demand to decline, either consumers or investors, or both, have to hesitate to part with their money for one reason or another. That is when current national output cannot all be sold, and producers cut back their production to a level that can be sold at prices that cover production costs. When this happens throughout the economy, national output declines and unemployment increases since fewer workers are hired to produce a smaller output. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, some people saved their money at home in a jar or under a mattress, since thousands of bank failures had led them to distrust banks. This reduced aggregate demand, since this money that was saved, since this money was saved, that was saved was not invested. Some indication of the magnitude and duration of the Great Depression can be found in the fact that the 1929 level of output, $104 billion in the dollars of that year, fell to $56 billion by 1933. Taking into account changes in the value of money during this era, the 1929 level of real output was not reached again until 1936. For an economy to take seven years to get back to its previous level of output is extraordinary, one of the many extraordinary things about the Great Depression of the 1930s.